Okay, Kevin. First, let me let me start off by saying one of the one of the things that fascinated me the most about doing a little research uh, into the film Higher Power was there was a moment where you talk about how the director Matthew Santoro had had talked to you about using lines of the dialogue and incorporating it into the music of the film itself. How how did you feel when he first came to you about that, and how did you go about approaching it? First, I, I mean, when he when he mentioned it to me, uh, there there was a specific line in the dialogue, and it was it was referenced in the movie. I mean, I guess I can talk about it now since the movie's released. Um, there is a lighthouse in flashbacks in the in the movie, and the father and daughter, when she was very young, the lighthouse had a rhythmic pattern to it, and it was one one two three four one two three. So the father, with the, his young daughter, their little thing was he spelled out the phrase, I love you, with the beats of the lighthouse. So that became their thing. So the director wanted that to be conveyed musically throughout the score. So I, I, when, I, when he explained that to me, I was like, that, that's an awesome idea. And it was actually a great starting point for a lot of the cues throughout the score. Um, and it ended up being more of a, a rhythmic idea rather than a musical melodic idea. So it, it sometimes the, that that little rhythmic motif was a backbone for some of the pieces throughout the score. And, and I know, and I'm sure you you've heard this a lot. They always talk about how the the, the music is is its own character in a film. But did, did you find this approach to it really integrated the music deeply into the fibers of the film? Yes, yes, it definitely helped. Yes, and I thought it was a, I thought it was a great idea when he when he mentioned it. Anything, anything in the past you've worked on that was f- similar or familiar to that approach, or was this one of those like, okay, this is interesting, first time? Yeah, this was this was the first time I, I've encountered this type of request, and it was really um, back when we when I first met with Matthew before they were done uh, shooting the film. That as soon as he told me this idea, I, I wanted to start writing the music. It mean like it. it like it, it, a light went off in my head and this huge like blow of inspiration um just from that sort of idea really got the juices flowing so yeah it was the first time i've encountered it and it was and it was great to incorporate and, and that i i think take, taking that to it to to a bigger picture in regards to the, the you know what what matthew had requested when you're working on projects what is it you're looking for from the director or the point person going into you doing your your contribution to the project? Um, I ask them, and, and I and I and actually I require them to to explain to me how they want uh, the audience to feel. You know what 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 the scene is conveying. What what type of support emotional support does the story need so i mean i don't expect them to talk to me in musical terms i'd rather they not some you know some do some can um but it's my job as a composer to decipher those those emotions into you know music and then i go you know go back into my studio and i create ideas and then we have sort of an iterative process to see if you know um i'm I'm, I'm nailing what what the director is looking for emotionally. You you know you touched upon it. It just it popped a question in my head. It for, as, as someone who 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 composes and is responsible for that heavy artistic aspect of, of whether it's a film, a video game, or a television series. How do you how do you handle that instance where somebody may come to you you know while filming and approach you in a manner that you you get the impression okay. I've been doing this for years. I compose. It's music. There are so many more layers to it than what you're coming to. How do how do you approach those types of situations? Um, it, it's it's basically. I mean, you have to find out the language that the film it has. I mean, like the musical language. I mean, yes, there's all different aspects of writing a score. There's all different layers of uh, styles of music, um, instruments, and all that stuff. But you sort of have to. Um, find out what's what's the best way to convey what the director's looking for i mean sometimes it can be uh, uh you know all different and many different styles you know it's you sort of have to come to an agreement of what's needed is it going to be a minimal approach is it going to be an over-the-top orchestral approach so i mean it's no matter what the request
request is or, or the guidelines are, there's always a common ground you have to find with the director um, to, to give the movie, the film, TV show, the support it needs. Um, looking over your body of work, uh, and, and this is one of the things I know that's really going to impress uh, the readers for ble- on, on our website, you have a wide body of work, not just in movies, but in video game, uh, with uh, Hunter the Demon's Forge, in, in television animation, with Justice League action, uh, Constantine City of Demons. Is there, is there a difference in what you do when working in those different fields, or is there a, much, is there a bigger commonality than a lot of people might, might realize? Uh, video games are the far, the most different from TV and film. Uh, only because a lot of the times when you're writing for video games, you're not writing for a linear story. Uh, sometimes you are, very rarely you're not. You're sort of writing, you know, sections of music um, that support a overall feel of a certain, you know, level in the game or a certain character. Um, but TV and film, you're writing linearly. As far as music goes... Um, you know, it, it's, I find it, to me, I find it more reward, rewarding to write music literally than sort of, I, I don't want to put it, the, you know, a name to it, but like a canned music, you know, like, sure. okay, we need two minutes here, we need two minutes there. It's, like, I find that I, I am, I need, I need constraints. Mm-hmm. I need a box, you know, mm-hmm. to... It's sort of like, uh, you know, painting a picture. Mm-hmm. You have a canvas. Uh, you're not, you have, you know, and a specific idea. Uh, so when writing music for film and TV, I tend to like not only the, the extreme deadlines that are, that come along with that, um, but the fact that you, you're supporting a specific story or a specific character throughout whether it be an 11 minute episode, half hour episode, or, you know, an hour and a half film. Um, I don't, as much as I love writing for video games, I mean, it's great. You can actually exercise different musical muscles that you don't get to exercise in film and TV. There's more of a, there's satisfactions on both sides. Um, but I tend to lean towards the more linear, um, but as far as composing, it's, it's, I mean, it's composing music very similar, um, across the board. When, when you're going into a project, is there do you, your inspiration for a project? Does it change per project? Is there a, a a a collection of inspiration you carry along with you per for, per project that you're working on? How do you do that that type of creative mind setup? Um, for each project, I like to start with a bare bones uh, template for my music. Um, and in other words, when a project starts, I I research the, the topic, I read the script, I look at any concept art, um, and then I sort of, you know, build a sound palette out of that. Now, sometimes I, I create sounds from one project that sort of, because, you know, they end up working so well, they sort of, you know, leak from project to project. Maybe they change a little bit, but you know, sometimes that they're, they're so... They, they spark the imagination so well that I will, you know, I'll use them and not, you know, maybe they will be a center point of one, one project, but in the next project, they might be like a starting point and they'll, you know, by the end of the of writing a piece, they might disappear altogether. But as far as um, the sounds and everything, each project I try to approach completely different because each, each thing is its own entity. So if you want to support that, you don't want the films to sound too films, TV, or whatever, whatever project it is, mm. it sounds similar. I mean, obviously, being an artist, um, you have your own sound, um, your own way of doing things. So that sort of will leak from project to project, without a doubt. But I try to, as far as sounds and template and and instrumentation, I try to give its own project, each project its own voice. Okay. Um, looking back, and this is, uh, and, and I always get a lot of oohs when I ask this question, but looking, looking over your career, is there a particular project that you look back upon and go, you know what, I really nailed that one? And then on the other side, is there one that you look at and go back now like, ooh, if I could have a do-over, I would adjust this, this, this? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I can't say 
there are things with every project that I wish I could go back and redo. Um, I don't think I've ever got done with the project or looked back on the project and thought, wow, man, I really nailed that. I, I mean, that's just my, I mean, maybe it's just me. It's my personality. I, I always think I could do better. I always think that, yeah, there's a better way to do that. And, you know, I come across that with colleagues and other artists, you know, um, not, not to say that I'm not proud of my work and other stuff, but rarely do I look back and say, man, that couldn't have been any better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that never, never comes across my mind. And you're right. That that is the common answer that I've gotten through interviews. It's there's a quick rush to something I could have fixed, but there's always that hesitation on oh, the one that I look back proudly. No, no, no. Always could make changes. Right. Exactly. There's better ways to do things. I mean, also especially looking back with the knowledge you have now, you know, to say oh man, if I you know it's all if I knew this then type of thing, you know. Yep. And now, and now, of course, Kevin, our million-dollar question. Um, we always make it a point of asking this because it's just the type of personal stuff that our readers and our listeners love to know about. Would you be kind to share with us a geek guilty pleasure, either you currently have or it could have been one you had when you were growing up? A geek guilty pleasure? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, I guess it's a guilty pleasure being that I'm an adult and, <laughs> uh, but I, I still love action figures. Excellent. I still, I still love collecting. Oh, well then I, I'm going to have to ask you the obvious follow-up. What, what have you most recently collected? Uh, I, I'm looking around my studio right now to see if there's anything recent. Um, it hasn't been, usually it's Star Wars stuff. Mm, oh, and there's enough out. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think it was an, an alien, uh, uh, a xenomorph, uh, alien maquette that I that I bought from no. uh, side. Excellent, very excellent. Okay, no, let me tell you something. That's a that's a proud geek guilty pleasure. Nothing wrong with that. You you are gonna have a lot of people applauding you uh, when they hear this. Trust me. <laughs> Sometimes you know, I, you know, people come into my studio, and I don't know if they're gonna be like, "This guy's got a problem." <laughs> or, wow, this is pretty cool. <laughs> You, you know what it was? I used to hang my action figures in my office, and I used to tell people, even if you come in angry at me, my action figures are going to get you to calm down just enough that you're not going to yell at me. So I figured exactly. there's an advantage. That's true. That is very true. Okay, excellent. Action figures, fantastic. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. No um, problem. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And again, folks, don't forget, check out Higher Power. We're going to have all the information on the, on the site here where the interview is going to be located about how you can get access to that film. And again, Kevin, thank you so much for joining me for uh, this interview. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ray. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you.